I'm going to speak today on a subject that is really near and dear to my heart. It's one of all the physical blessings that God gives to us, gives to me. It's really the one I treasure the most. We last week celebrated fathers, and we just heard a song about families. Well, unfortunately, this treasure that I hold dear to me is one that is being beaten and battered and destroyed in our world today. Yesterday, the Supreme Court handed down a ruling, July 27, 2015, five to four ruling that said that states could no longer ban same-sex marriage. In doing so, they immediately and effectively did away with the God-given biblical definition of marriage and replaced it with a man-made definition of marriage. As I said, marriage is beaten, it's battered, this institution in our world today. And we hear of the discouraging statistics. 50% of the people that are married get divorced, and many of the rest of them live in misery. At least that's what we hear, frustrated, unhappy lives. And we constantly hear the death toll being wrong for marriage. And a lot of people question whether it's really even useful, really even needed in our society. But how does God look at the institution of marriage, this special union that he created between one man who's born as a man and one woman who's born as a woman? How does he look at that? Well, Paul tells us that marriage should be honored and treasured. In Hebrews 13, we can turn there. Paul gives concluding remarks, moral and spiritual information, and instruction to the Hebrews. And in the midst of these remarks, he speaks about marriage. Hebrews 1, or Hebrews 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in, the, are in the body also. Verse 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Verse 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Here among the midst or in the midst of these exhortations, to have brotherly love, to remember the strangers, to remember those in prison, to be sexually pure, to not be covetousness, to be content, we find an exhortation to hold marriage honorable to all people and to all things. We're supposed to treat marriage as an honorable institution. And that work, word for honor here is really an interesting word because its connection to marriage, it's commonly used in the New Testament to mean something precious, something precious. That Greek word is timios, timios. And it means valuable, costly, honored, esteemed, beloved, dear, and most precious. I like the way the Amplified Version of the Bible translates verse 4. It says, let marriage be held in honor, esteemed, worthy, precious, of great price, and especially dear in all things. And that word honor is used in 2 Peter 1, 4, or 2 Peter 1, 4, where it refers to the exceedingly great and precious, that's the word honor, promises of God through which we can be partakers in the divine nature. And it's also used in 1 Peter 1, verse 19, where it refers to the precious honor, blood of Christ. That's how precious marriage should be. In Hebrews 13, 4, when it talks about let marriage be held in honor among you, we should hear the ring of preciousness. We should think of it as a precious thing, as a treasure like gold and silver and a fine jewel, revered, 
especially dear, something we want to have and hold dear. You know, is there really hope for marriage? As I said, the statistics say that 50% of marriages end in divorce. You know, can your marriage stand the test of time, especially in this world that we're in? Can it stand the test of Satan? Can your marriage thrive? Can it excel? Can it be a precious, honorable union? You know, God wants it to be. He desires that our marriages thrive. God has a purpose for marriage, and that purpose goes far beyond, actually, the physical union of a man and a woman. And regardless of how the Supreme Court will define marriage, God's definition goes back before the Supreme Court was made, before the U.S. Constitution was made, and before the government of man was put into place. Marriage is woven throughout Scripture. Throughout Scripture, from Genesis, the first marriage, through the Song of Solomon, a love poem, through God's marriage to ancient Israel, through the teachings of Jesus and of Paul, and finally to the culmination of the wedding supper at Jesus' return. And there are various reasons why some may not be married, may not choose to be married. Paul, a dynamic apostle of Christ, wasn't married, but Peter was. We know that from Matthew 8, 14. It talks about his mother-in-law and that Jesus came and healed her. And early tradition tells us that some of the apostles were married and some weren't. So marriage isn't a requirement to enter the kingdom of God. But you know, many of the lessons that we learn to be good Christians are lessons that we use in our marriages. And many of the lessons we have to be a good, in a good marriage are the lessons that we use to have good relationships among others and to be a mature Christian. So let's take a look at the beginning of marriage. You can turn with me to Genesis 2. This wonderful gift to mankind began at the very beginning of man. We'll start in verse 18, just to see where marriage came from. Genesis 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. I find it interesting that when you go through Genesis 1, you read of God creating or recreating things. And what does he say at the end of each one of those things? I saw it was good. I saw it was good. Here's the first time God says something wasn't good. It wasn't good that man should be alone. And God reinforces that because he has Adam look at all the animals to show him that he doesn't have a companion. In verse 19, we read, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see that he would call, what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Verse 20, So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Adam finds that there's... Nobody there for him. Nobody who can be a companion for him. So God creates that companion. In verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh of its, in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Verse 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. You know, I've often looked at this scripture and thought how Adam said this. You know, the King James Version brings it across. It's very matter-of-factly. So I kind of wonder if Adam wasn't half Vulcan, you know, like Spock, Star Trek. And he says, no emotion, just a statement of logic, of fact. Now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman live long and prosper. And that was the end of it. 
But that isn't what the Hebrew reads. That isn't what it reads. The Hebrew word there for now is pa'am. Pa'am, and is typically or can be rendered much more intensely, much more emotionally than the word just now. Pa'am means to impel. Adam was excited. Here he had this person that could be his companion. Several translations of the Bible actually end that part now with an exclamation point. Adam had looked around and seen Adam, and none of them were like him. None of them could be his companion. That word pa'am actually literally means this now at last with an exclamation point. The ERV version translates it, and, man, and the man said, finally, one like me with bones from my bones and a body of, from my body. Adam was excited about this new person that God had created as a companion for him, for a relationship, for a lifetime with him. Marriage was created by God at the very beginning of mankind for a lifetime union. But this isn't the only time the scripture is actually used. We see that actually twice in the New Testament. This same scripture is referred back to, and each time it gives us additional understanding of this union of two people and of the purpose of marriage. The first is in Matthew 3, or Matthew 19, verse 3. In Matthew 19, verse 3, we can read an additional purpose or understanding about this. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who are trying to trap him with arguments, but Jesus uses that trap to explain and teach lessons about marriage. Matthew 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Verse 5. And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall be one flesh. Verse 6, So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Now I understand there are reasons for divorce, but Jesus is reiterating here the importance and permanence of marriage, and that God is the one who is joining the two people together, and ultimately we are responsible to him. In the second place in the New Testament, is in, a, is in Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, Paul talks about marriage as a great mystery. Now I'm sure we'd go, yeah, you know, it is. It is a great mystery. I mean, how do I get along with my wife and what was she thinking and, you know, what's he thinking doing that and whatever. It is a great mystery, but this scripture brings a special, unique understanding to that. And I'm actually going to read this in the New Living Version. Ephesians 5, I'm going to start with verse 20. And we, the church, are members of his, Christ's, body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Verse 32, this is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. The great mystery is that marriage has a deep, a deep spiritual significance. At its most perfect level, marriage should picture the relationship between Christ and the church. And it should picture a relationship of one. The oneness of Jesus and the church. When we realize that marriage is more than just a physical relationship between two people, a man and a woman, but that it's an example of Christ and the church and that relationship, we need to even honor marriage more and see it for the beauty and preciousness that it is. Now, what is the purpose of marriage? What is the purpose of marriage? We've already seen two. Humans shouldn't be lonely. They shouldn't. Marriage brings partnership, it brings companionship. 
And as we've just read, read, marriage illustrates a mystery of the relationship between Jesus and the church. But what are some of the other purposes of marriage? Well, in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, we read that marriage helps us to not sin because it says, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Malachi 2.15 tells us another purpose for marriage. Marriage is designed to produce godly children. Marriage is designed to produce godly children. In Malachi 2.15 it says, But did he not make them one, talking of the husband and wife, having a remnant of the spirit, and why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Marriage, another reason. Marriage is the foundation, the foundational unit of the family, which is used to build society. If you turn with me to Genesis 1, 27 and 28, we'll read about this. In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, Starting in verse 27, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In verse 28, it says, then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. It's through that family unit that we build a society. And the marriage, the husband and the wife, are those, or is what's the foundation of that marriage. If you start attacking that, society begins to suffer. Another reason for marriage is that marriage is a framework for a family which is built to help pass on the knowledge of God to our children and to teach the ways of God. In Deuteronomy 11:18, it tells us about this. Moses is writing here about the time right after the second tablets, Ten Commandments, were delivered to the children of Israel. In verse 18 of Deuteronomy 11, it says, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign in your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children. Speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. That's basically everywhere. But if you look, a lot of this is being done in the home. Verse 20, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. 21, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land which the Lord swore to the fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth. A successful marriage is not miraculously arranged in heaven. God made men and women able and capable to make marriages work, though. But we are human. We constantly face pitfalls. Prince Charming and Cinderella don't always live happily ever after. Neither do Shrek and Fiona. I've got grandkids. I'm starting to get back into these again. Or Jasmine and Aladdin. Life often gets in the way of a happy marriage. Life has a way of chipping away at it. Children, lack of sleep, careers, jobs, travel, financial difficulties, stress, conflict, misunderstandings. You know, we're all living life at the speed of light anymore. And we often wake up at some point and say, I hardly know this person anymore. I hardly know this person anymore. But we can't have a happy, wonderful marriage where the honeymoon really doesn't end. It's just the beginning of an incredible journey of two people. And no two marriages are alike. No two marriages are alike. No two people are alike. The way they blend themselves together, their likes, their dislikes, their personalities, they're all different. What works with one marriage may not work with another but we still can make them work. It may be a unique challenge, though. 
You know, many of the guidelines for a happy marriage are the same exact guidelines to be a good Christian. When you really look at it, being a good Christian will help you be a, have a good marriage. To have a good, strong relationship with your spouse, the same things help you have a good, strong relationship with other people. I'd like to turn to just a few of these guidelines. Actually, I'm going to just go to one. There are many other ones. But let's take a look at one of the, some of these guidelines about being a mature Christian. Let's turn to Colossians 3. Colossians 3. In Colossians 3, Paul's telling the Colossians that they need to put to death the carnal nature and replace it with something else, something better, something better. Attributes of a Christian. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 12, we read, 3 verse 12, we read, we read, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. And now as we read these, let's look at these not only as to a Christian, a fellow Christian, and how we act, but let's look at it in the context of marriage, between the attitudes of a husband and a wife. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, our spouse, husband, wife, we should look at them. If they're working and trying to be a Christian, be, we should look at them as the elect of God, holy and beloved, somebody that should be treated with honor and respect. Continuing, put on tender mercies, tender mercies, a compassionate heart, the NIV version of the Bible says, clothe ourselves with compassion. Compassion is an inner emotion. It's associated with a very, at the very heart and core of a person. Continuing kindness. This is one of the things we should put on. Out of compassion comes kindness. As we have compassion in our heart, we should show kindness to others. Put on humility and meekness. Humility and meekness brings a desire to help others. It should bring a desire to help our spouse. It isn't in something that says, I want my way. It's something that says, I want your way. I want to help you. And it's also the foundation of forgiveness. Both asking for forgiveness and extending forgiveness to someone else, to your spouse, excuse me, to your spouse. Continuing on, long-suffering, verse 13, bearing with one another. You know, there are going to be times in your marriage where you're going to have to suffer long. You're going to have to have patience, bear with the other one, make sure you don't have a short fuse. But we need to be patient with one another. Patient with other Christians, patience with our spouse. Continuing and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Sometimes this is one of the hardest commandments, isn't it? To forgive somebody else. And for some reason, a lot of times it's harder to forgive your own spouse. But we need to look what Christ did for us. And you know, these, these words forgive... And forgiving, there's actually several words in the New Testament for forgive and forgiving. This word that's used here is a really interesting use of it or meaning of it. It talks about grant as a favor, graciously, in kindness, pardon or rescue, forgive freely. We need to be gracious as we forgive. Grant them the favor. Forgive them the debt. Don't exact the payment. But graciously grant the favor of kindness. Continuing in verse 14, but above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. This form of love here is the form agape, a love that has to do with affection and altruistic actions and deeds, a selfless love which is the bond of perfection and completeness. Marriage is based on that. Not selfishness, 
but selflessness. Not asking what's and wanting what's good for me, but what's good for us. And in verse 15 it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. As we grow in these traits, both as a Christian and in a marriage, we will have the peace of God in our marriage. And that's a wonderful thing. And then finally it says be thankful. Be thankful. That's not a trait that we typically have in us a lot of times. But let's be thankful for the small things in marriage and the big things. A word of thanks is real uplifting to someone else. It makes them feel appreciated. These are all wonderful Christian qualities of two people in marriage. Acknowledging and treating each other as the elect of God, as holy, as beloved, treating each other with compassion, with kindness, humble, meek, not overbearing, not proud, patient, and being thankful. They're all what we want to be as Christians. They're all what we want to be as a husband and a wife. This is the type of marriage I strive for, the type of Christian I strive to be also is what's spoken about here. And there's little difference between that which is in marriage and that which is in between Christians as far as how we should treat each other. A little over a year ago, I performed my first marriage. It was between or for a niece of mine. They'd grown to love each other, care for each other, and they wanted to make it that bond with God. And as part of their premarital um, counseling, I talked to them about several of the things my wife and I had learned over the years that we'd been married. And I went through those with them. Because I thought, you know, there are a lot of things that I learned that I went through the hard knocks. And maybe if I could give them a little bit of help, it helped them. And so I told them some of the principles of a good marriage as my wife, Emmy, and I saw over the 38 years that we've been married. Now I'm going to share some of those with you. Share some of those that I went through with, with the two of them. The first piece of advice I gave them was, watch your expectations. Watch your expectations. We go into marriage often with great expectations of what marriage is going to be like, of what my spouse is going to be like, of what life is going to be like. We have rose-colored glasses, as we've often heard, but reality often doesn't match that. I had two friends in college. I think it was my senior year in college. And they got engaged. And I was in class, uh, statistics class, one morning. And class hadn't started yet. And he was telling all of us about what marriage was going to be like. Now, he wasn't married yet, but he said, and he told us, he says, you know, I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to come home, and it, my wife's going to meet me at the door with a beer in one hand, with the paper in the other hand, and wearing a cute little dress. And she was going to let me relax on the sofa while she just effortlessly went around finishing up supper and let me relax from a hard day's work. And then we would sit down to an intimate candlelit supper. And by that time, I'd been married a couple of years, and I realized that probably wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so I don't remember if I told him that or not. But uh, anyway, I asked him several years later when I saw him how that was going. <laughs> he just chuckled. <laughs> so normally life often doesn't match up to our expectations. We have to be careful about our expectations. Marriage isn't a romantic novel where the knight rides up on his white horse or where the Hollywood model wife is always fresh and, you know, in this slinkly little dress or whatever. And it just doesn't happen that way. But marriage is even better than that. Another name for expectations is selfishness. And we need to minimize that in marriage. And your wife and your husband, they can't read your minds. So if you do have certain expectations, please let them know. 
and let them understand those needs. A second piece of advice I gave them is marriage is not 50-50. Marriage is not 50-50. It should be 100%, 100%. When my wife and I got married, it was in the 70s. And for those of you who remember the 70s, women's rights were very big at that time. And that was a very big, often thing you would hear. My marriage is going to be right. It's going to be 50-50. And my wife and I, we went into marriage and we said, you know, I don't like that idea. It seems like I'm holding something back. It seems like I'm keeping count of what's mine, what's yours, what you've done, what I've done. So she and I immediately, as we went into our marriage, said it's going to be 100%, 100%. Not 50-50. Marriage is about not mine, not yours, but about what's ours. It's about growing. It's about maturing. It's about becoming a couple. One, 100% one at its perfection. It isn't talking about what you get out of marriage, but what you become in marriage. It's about caring for the other one. It's not about what I've given but what we've become and how I've helped you. And when God says that we're supposed to become one, he isn't talking about 50 and 50 totaling one. He's talking about giving 100%. A third piece of advice I gave was to fight fair. To fight fair. Yes, even great marriages have their difficult times, but you need to learn to fight fair. No low blows. No fighting at all costs. Don't cross the line to say things you just know will hurt the other. And don't use intimacy or withholding of intimacy as a weapon. Weapon, And don't use the silent treatment just for punishment. Now, there are times when you may not speak to each other, but it's not out of punishment. And never, ever, ever hit your wife or your spouse or your husband. And that goes either way. There's never a place for that. Physical, emotional, or verbal abuse. Proverbs 12, 18 says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. In Ephesians 4, 15, Paul challenges Christians to live a life of speaking the truth in love. Many of us do a very good job at the first half of that, speaking the truth. We don't do a very good at the second half, doing it in love. That's the challenge, is to do it in love. And believe it or not, it is okay to go to bed mad. Not ideal, but okay. When my wife and I were first married, we thought the scripture from Ephesians 4, 26, where it says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. We thought that meant that we had to struggle all through the night to fix whatever problem we had. And we realized over time that we were just getting tireder and meaner and uglier. And the other one was getting the same. We realized that we needed to take a break, especially when it was getting late and we, it was getting tired. We were getting tired. We realized we had to take a break because we reached a point of what I call diminishing returns. That's something my family hears quite often in my household, a point of diminishing returns. When I'm working on a big project and I'm gotten so tired that I'm probably going to do more harm than help. I'll say, I've reached the point of diminishing returns. I need to stop and take a rest. And that's what Emmy and I realized we needed to do from time to time. You reach a point of diminishing returns. And at that point, resolve together to take up the problem tomorrow. And that you still love each other and you still want to work it out. You're still committed to each other, but you still want to work it out. You still want to work out whatever issue you have. Because that scripture, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, means we should take care of our issues quickly and not let them fester. A fourth piece of advice is freely forgive. 
Freely forgive. Just as we've been forgiven of our sins, we need to be willing to forgive our spouses of the wrongs that they commit to us and that they've done to us. And we shouldn't bring up mistakes of the past. If they're forgiven, they should be forgotten. There's an old saying that says, the first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. The first to forget is the happiest. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it says in several translations, love is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. When we forgive, we shouldn't keep a record of it. We should wipe the record clean. Roderick McFarlane wrote a piece called Never, List, Never Listed His Faults in the December 1992 Reader's Digest. It goes, on her golden wedding anniversary, my grandmother revealed a secret to her long and happy marriage. On my wedding day, I decided to choose 10 of my husband's faults, which, for the sake of our marriage, I would overlook. She explained, a guest asked her to name some of the faults. To tell you the truth, she replied, I never did get around to making that list. But whenever my husband did something that made me hopping mad, I would say to myself, lucky for him, that's one on the list. She didn't keep track of his faults and mistakes. A fifth piece of advice is spend time with each other. Spend time with each other. Make time for the two of you. Spend moments together sharing your life. Set aside special time on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis where you can get together and be just the two of you. It's one of the things my wife and I have always done. We've gotten away, even if it was for a weekend, even when we had small children, just the two of us. It was during that time that we realized we really did like each other. Even though there were the kids around us constantly hounding us, all the, we were so busy all the time. But when we were set aside the time, we realized that we really do like each other. And when the kids left the house, we still liked each other. We knew that. For all those years, we knew that when the kids left the house, and we loved them very much, but we knew we'd love each other, and we still could have a happy marriage together. So make sure you date. My wife and I, as I said, have been married 38 years. We've been dating for 40. Laugh and have fun. It'll help you through the difficult times in life. Never become an old married couple. Your marriage can be young even as you grow old together. When my wife and I were newlyweds, we chose an aunt and an uncle to be our marriage mentors. They were living a marriage that we thought we wanted to be like. One of the things they showed us is that their marriage, even though they were older, was vibrant and happy and young. And we've always taken it as an example to us that our lives, no matter how old we are, can be happy, can be exciting, can be fun. A sixth piece of advice is persevere. Hang in there. Be committed to each other until death. And I realize there are cases where this doesn't happen. There are cases, and there are cases which God allows for that to happen. But this is what we should strive for, to be committed to each other until death. I mean, I know that there are times when we're in the middle of a fight, and her and I were trying to think last night how many we could really think of, and I know we have a lot more than we can think of now, but again, we don't keep score. We could think of three that have really been, you know, knocked down drag outs as such, and they really weren't even that. But we realized that if we made it through that, that it would be better on the other side. We were both committed because of that to work through our problems, to hang in there, to stay there, to be strong in our marriage and be committed to it. That vow we made to each other was not only a vow to each other, but to God and to the community and our family. And there's research, a lot of it, that shows that in most marriages, unless there is abuse or various other things, that if you hang in there together, 
In five years, you'll be happier than the people who did not. In five years, you'll be happier than the people who did not. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. When times in marriage are difficult, don't lose heart. Hang in there. Reap the benefits that will come if you work on enriching your marriage. A seventh piece of advice is that your spouse is not your enemy. Your spouse is not your enemy. That seems like a simple piece of advice, but it's amazing how often we can look at our spouse as our enemy. There was a couple I was reading about who they always had problems. Whenever one of them would bring up an idea, the other one always shot it down right away. And they decided, you know what? Let's go ahead and say this. From now on, we will love each other's idea for five seconds. At least five seconds. And then we will talk. They're not the enemy. The spouse isn't. They should be your friend. Galatians 5.15 says, talking about the church, If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. In Mark 3.25, Christ said, If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Learn to support each other. Be a cheerleader for the other. Be a source of strength and comfort and encouragement to the other. Respect them, uplift them, build them up. Love and cherish each other. Find strength in each other. Strive to be, and this is something my wife and I said often, strive to be me and you against the world. Me and you against the world, not me against you and you against me. You shouldn't compete with each other. You should complete each other. And don't talk bad about your spouse in front of others. Don't talk negatively in public about your spouse. It's so easy to do that so often when you're around people, you'll hear them talking about their spouse and they'll say bad things. Resist that urge. I always speak positively about them. I always show respect in front of others about your spouse. But again, even with that, sometimes there are issues that may come up in a marriage where you do have to talk to somebody to get help or advice. If you do that, choose wisely who you select. An eighth, eighth piece of advice is to do little things that show your love. Do little things that show your love. Shortly before I was married, I read about every book I could about marriage. So I grew up in a family of all boys, six of us. I didn't know much about women. Um, and it showed in a lot of ways. So I thought I had to learn about how to treat my wife. One of the books I read was Letters to Philip by Dr. Charlie Shedd. It was written in the 60s and 70s. It's about how to treat your wife. It's a bit dated, but it had a tremendous impact on me. There's also another book that's its companion called Letters to Karen. That's written for wives. Both books discussed, and one of the key things it brought out was that we need to show love and respect and care for our spouses and that the little things are important in life. Doing the little things. Putting your arm around your wife. Holding her hand. The wife packing a little note maybe in with the lunch. Little things like that that keep your life and your marriage alive and happy and exciting. And one of the keys there is find out what your, what your spouse enjoys. Because you may do, be doing something that your spouse doesn't even enjoy. I used to make supper for my wife every now and then. Found out she didn't enjoy that because <laughs> I left the kitchen messy. So I quickly learned that she'd rather have the kitchen cleaned than the food made. So. We have to learn what they really enjoy. Never let a day go by without saying a compliment to your spouse. There was a couple who were celebrating their diamond wedding anniversary. The reporter asked the old gentleman for the secret of happiness. The old man took him aside, pulled out his watch, 
Engraved on the back of the inside was the message, say something nice to Sarah. He knew that was important, to always be there with a kind word. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says in the New Living Translation, so encourage each other and build each other up. Build each other and encourage each other. Find something to praise them about. Follow the example of God who's going to say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. One of the things, little things, that Emmy does for me that I, I've always found amazing, she can be reading the last couple of pages of an exciting book. And if I walk over, it amazes me. She'll put it down, dog ear the page, and she'll talk to me. I'm not that way. I've got to forge forward, and it's something I've had to learn. But that's a little thing she does for me that I really enjoy. The last piece of advice I'll give you is make God an essential partner in your marriage. Make God an essential partner in your marriage. When God's in your marriage, you have a special access to a source of strength, love, compassion, forgiveness, commitment that you won't otherwise have. John 10.10 10 says, God's ways bring life and life abundantly. If we follow God's ways and let God be in our marriage, our marriage should be abundant, filled with abundance. Pray for each other. How often do we pray for our children and our grandchildren and forget to pray for our own spouse? Pray together during difficult times. You know, is, is God really that important in a marriage? Is he really that important in a marriage? Well, in 2008, the Barna Group came out with a study, a survey that shocked a lot of Christians, shocked the Christian world. The essence of that was that Christians actually get divorced at exactly the same or virtually the same rate as non-Christians do. And actually, if you're an atheist or an agnostic, you had a better chance of staying together in marriage than a Christian did. But what's the real truth on that? Does God, having God as a partner in our marriage have any difference, make any difference? Well, it's interesting. There was a noted researcher, Shante Felhan, author of the book, The Good News About Marriage, Debunking Discouraging Myths About Marriage and Divorce, that wanted to take a deeper look into those statistics. So she actually partnered with the Barna Group and, and asked them for the data because what she wanted to say is, do practicing Christians have a different divorce rate than just people who call themselves Christians? So when she partnered with the Barna Group, she re-ran their survey, and she included just one thing, one thing in their survey, one piece of information. Were you in church last week? That's the only thing she added into there. When she did that, she found out that the divorce rate dropped 27% compared to those who weren't in church last week. She writes, what appears intuitive is true. Couples who regularly practice any combination of serious religious behaviors and attitudes, such as attend church nearly every week, read their Bibles and spiritual materi excuse me, materials regularly, pray privately and together, generally take their faith seriously, living not as perfect disciples, but serious disciples, enjoy significantly lower divorce rates than mere church members, the general public, and unbelievers. And another study by William or by W. Bradford Wilcox, a leading sociologist at the University of Virginia, found from his own research the same thing. And he writes, whether young or old, male or female, low income or not, those who said that they were more religious reported higher average levels of commitment to their partners, higher levels of marital satisfaction, less thinking and talking about divorce, and lower levels of negative interaction. He continues in his report saying, research found that religious commitment was more important to success in marriage than what would seem like more important variables, such as income, education, 
or age of first marriage. Having God in our lives and having the fellowship of the friends and family that we have from God around us is very critical and has a very positive impact on the quality of our marriages. The Song of Solomon isn't a book that we go to very often, but I'd like to take a look at two verses in the Song of Solomon. Two verses that talk about love in a beautiful way. Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon in verse eight, or in chapter eight, starting in verse six. It says, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Verse 7, many waters cannot, cannot quench love, rivers cannot wash it away. What a wonderful comment on what love is and what should be in a marriage between two people. One of the happiest things I ever did as a child was to have a sleepover with my best friends. I feel very thankful that I have that as a lifelong thing now. I have a sleepover with my very best friend. How important is it to invest in your marriage, to invest in that? Well, I'd like to read a little story from that book I mentioned, Letters to Philip, by Dr. Charlie Shedd. He says, I used to hunt ducks with a man who had a thing about his guns, his rifles. He polished his guns with some special kind of oil that smelled like bananas. When we were setting in the duck blinds and the ducks weren't around, he would lecture me on my poor care of my gun. My gun had scratches on it. It had pitting in the barrel because he said I wasn't cleaning it properly. I didn't clean it right when I came home, and that's why I had that. I kept hunting with him because he had a great duck hunting spot, and he was having marriage problems, and I hoped I could help him overcome that. But he ended up getting divorced anyway. When I would visit him afterwards, we would sit in his den with all the animal heads on the walls and the beautiful oiled banana-smelling guns. He would take them out as we talked and sometimes handle them and with tender, loving care. Then he would remind or remember how my gun looked, and he would begin his critique on my poor care of my guns and my responsibility to them. I would go home determined to get out my gun and clean it as I had never done before, because he said, how could somebody who had invested so much in his guns not take care of them? But you know what would happen? When I arrived home, my wife would be waiting for me at the door. So we would sit down on our rocking love seat, hold hands, visit, and in less time than it takes to look into her eyes, I completely forgot about my gun. The other day I was thinking back on all of this. A great idea occurred to me. Funny, isn't it, how we so often get these brilliant ideas late? That oil, banana oil, Brother, I was included in his lectures, at least one reference like this. I just can't understand how a man can invest so much in a gun and then let it go to pot. Isn't it a foolish thing for a, for a husband or a wife to invest so much in their marriage and let it go to pot? Invest in your marriage and you'll re re reap great rewards. Amy and I have been blessed with a wonderful marriage. And as I look around, I know many of you have that too. Finding and fine and wonderful examples of Christian marriages. Keep it up. God is well pleased that you honor and hold it precious. I know that much of what I'm at, who I am today is due to my wife. We grew up together. We were married at 19. But much of what I am today has been with the help of her. I'd like to turn to one last scripture. One last scripture. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 6. We began this sermon reading about the preciousness of marriage and about how God created marriage with Adam and Eve. 
In Revelation 19, we'll read about one more ultimate wedding and marriage. This ultimate goal that we'll be reaching for, if we hold strong, we'll have the special ceremony at Christ's return. Revelation 19, verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his, pe his wife, his people, those called and committed to God, the saints of God, has made herself ready. Verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Brethren, let's all be at that marriage supper. But until then, let's keep working on our marriages. Those of us who are married and those of us who aren't, we can still learn the many lessons that marriage can teach us. Let's keep on working and doing what's right and be at that marriage supper. <music>